Hello everyone and welcome to Now You're Playing With Power, a Nintendo podcast! This is episode 32 and my name is NBZ. It's three letters strung together in a row. If you can say them, then you, my friend, are intelligent. And joining me on this show today, as always, as per the usual, it's Bali. Good evening, NBZ. Good evening, sir. How are you? I am... Quite tired. It's been a long week, and now the week is starting again tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it never ends. I'm quite tired. Yeah, it just keeps on trucking. But you know, so does this podcast. So yeah, w- I guess we'd better get on with it. Absolutely, we better do. So uh, we have a, a cracking show for you today, and it includes three segments, of which Bally shall now tell you uh, what we're going to be talking about. We've got what we've been playing. We have emails, and then for our third segment. We're going to talk a little bit about Club Nintendo and the death of Club Nintendo. Yes, and rest in peace. Indeed. Looking forward to the future of what the Club Nintendo replacement might be. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a service that we both used over the years and uh, we have a lot of stuff to say about it. So uh, I guess you can stick around to hear our thoughts because, of course, it is going away very soon. So uh, very relevant, I think, uh, as a Nintendo podcast uh, to address that. So we will be talking about it. But... Uh, Before we get into any of our other segments, let's kick the show off uh, right and ready with the stuff that we have been playing recently. And Bali, uh, I think this is a a major time in the podcast history for you, a major time for a lot of people (laughs) listening, uh, because, you know, considering the number of people who uh, enjoy Fire Emblem uh, surrounding the stuff that I do, uh, you've been playing a Fire Emblem game, so why don't you tell people about it? Yes, I'm feeling the pressure right now. Um, Absolutely. I've been playing Fire Emblem 7. Now, I should say I was been quite busy the last couple of weeks. So I've only managed a few hours, but I, th- I feel I've played enough to at least have a few thoughts on the game. And don't worry, I will be talking about this game plenty in the future because it is quite a long game. Yeah, it'll probably be a similar situation to uh, Assassin's Creed 4 where you're yeah. just shipping along with it and you'll get to the end eventually. But uh, Exactly. But yeah, so... Here. I picked this game up for about four pounds thirty, four pounds fifty. They on... were doing a launch deal because it yeah. came out on the eShop, um, and as soon as it came out, it was in the middle of the lead up to Smash Brothers. So they were having the Smash Brothers sales, um, and which basically made loads of random games across all platforms on sale, including this one, which was really random um, yeah but... it, it came out that week and they just put it straight in it was like yeah. fuck it let's just do it right now might as well and uh, and you picked it up uh, right then because you knew you would be playing at some point exactly um, so so yeah so but, um you did initially you've talked about fire emblem game before you played sacred stone some on the ambassador yes um, but what were the what were the reasons here for you to pick this one up and start playing this one instead of going back to sacred so... stones I'm going to have a bit of a rant here. Okay, and I made this rant on Twitter a few days ago. <laughs> and I think this is applicable to Advance Wars as well. Um, and that is that basically Advance Wars 1 and Advance Wars 2 are a bit like Fire Emblem 7 and then Fire Emblem Sacred, the Sacred Stones. And that the big difference between the first of those games and the second of those games is that both of the first of those games, so Fire Emblem 7 and Advance Wars 1, have 10 missions at the start of the game that basically are tutorial missions and they pretty much hold your hand through 10 missions and they go through almost every aspect of the game whether if it's Advance Wars's case whether it's to do with naval combat air combat different weapons triangles and if in Fire Emblem's case it's it's all about the archers magic users Upgrading, defense, stuff like that. How to use thieves and stuff. Exactly. Knowing that a Pegasus Knight gets completely shafted by (laughs) Literally shafted. (laughs) Exactly. And they never tell you that in Sacred Stones. And it's really, really annoying. Um, So, yeah, I played a lot of Sacred Stones um, when we started the podcast, I want to say. Yeah, around that time. Um, I must have put it about... 30 hours into Sacred Stones. It can't have been that much. It must have been It's between 20 and 30 hours, honestly. Oh, jeez. Because I I finished the game uh, completely on my Ambassador uh, version and the final hour count was 32, uh, having finished the game. Oh, well, I'm basically really slow and died a lot. But, um, 
Yeah, so my issue is that Sacred Stones just doesn't tell you anything. And it really was a struggle to like get through missions. Uh, there were just really basic Fire Emblem things that I hadn't learned from Advance Wars because obviously they are still very different games. And I was just getting completely dicked on on a few missions and I kept dying. It wasn't much fun. I just didn't feel in control or knowledgeable about my units. Right. And, and you didn't have save states either, so exactly. you couldn't even like lean on this crutch. Uh, exactly, and I feel like between both Advance Wars and Fire Emblem, probably the most important thing is knowledge about your units and where to put them, how to use them, how to defend, how to attack, that kind of thing. And I just feel like Fire Emblem 7 is infinitely more fun for a Fire Emblem noob like myself because of those 10 missions at the start and I'm about to start the seventh mission and the first six have been an absolute joy to play so far because they've been telling me what to do who to move where um, there's still little parts of at the ends of these missions where you are left to do everything yourself and you do have to Put, to, put into practice what you've learned and set up on bosses in particular ways and things like that. And it's just really enjoyable so far. And I'm kind of pissed off with Nintendo for putting Sacred Stones on the Ambassador program and not Fire Emblem 7 because it yeah. just made more sense for someone who'd never gotten into the series. And I feel like out of Nintendo franchises... Fire Emblem and Advance Wars are quite unique in that their sequels don't have a whole lot of hand-holding, whereas I'd argue that almost every Zelda game, the first start, the start of the game, is quite hand-holdy at times. And whether it's your first or last Zelda, it'll teach you how to get the basics down and fight enemies, etc., etc. And yeah, yeah, Fire Emblem is just not quite like that, so... All right. Well, um, <clears throat> that's good, at least. You know, that's a positive thing that you are actually enjoying yourself. Yeah. Um, how are you finding uh, your characters? Are you kind of... I mean, what's your setup a lot of the time? Are you relying on the really powerful character Marcus, who you get at the start of the game? He is, you know, a, he's already promoted, and obviously he's a giant XP sp uh, XP sponge. That's a hard thing to say. Um, are you crutching on him, or are you trying to spread experience out throughout your party? Because the thing with Fire Emblem 7, unlike Sacred Stones, there's no overworld map. So you just go from chapter to chapter, and essentially there's no kind of opportunity to, aside from the arenas, uh, which you can abuse because you have save states, aside from the arenas, there's nowhere to uh, sit down and grind and get your levels up. So um, how are you doing with that stuff at the moment? Or are um, you not doing too much of it because it's kind of tutorializing? Yeah, um, I am trying to put the lower level characters into combat more and trying to just make the higher level characters sit at the back. Um, I can't even remember who Marcus is. Who's Marcus? He's the paladin. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> do, uh, do I have him yet? <laughs> you, you, you should... Uh, wait a second. It, yeah, he, you should do. No, I think the first magic user you get is called... No, 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 no. A paladin isn't a magic user. He's uh. the horseback guy. He's, uh. on, he's, on, he's, on, he's on horseback and he's... he's I don't have him yet. He, are you he's, sure about that? Like, no, Am I got... misremembering this really badly? Oh, um, I, I might get him in Mission 7, but I've not got him yet. Interesting. So I only who, have... who are the characters you have right now, then? If you can oh, remember names at all. I've got Ken and Sane. Mm -hmm. They're my only two horse users, other than the brand new guy I've got on with the bow and arrow. Right. I've got Lynn. Mm -hmm. um, God, names fail me really badly in this game. <laughs> um, um, I've got the healer girl. Right, Sarah. I've got the flying Pegasus girl. Florina. Florina, yep. yep. Um, and I've got... Who else have I got? I've got the, the archer. Uh, Will? Will, yep. yep. And I've got the With first... one L, strangely enough. <laughs> Will. And yep. I've got the first magic user, um, as well as a thief. I think Urk. Urk, yep, Urk. Um, and Matthew is your Matthew. thief. Matthew is my thief. So... Yes. Yeah, I'm just sort of, each mission's t getting me to grips with each of these characters, and it's really good. Um, I, and like I said, I try and put the weaker units into combat first, just because I know that it's it's just better in the long run to Absolutely. spread it around yeah. a bit. Um, I think it's super solid all around, really. Um, 
the like I said, the missions really tell you what's going on. I feel on top of things, which is nice. It's a unique feeling for me in Fire Emblem. So I'm looking forward to progressing to the harder levels and actually knowing what I'm doing. Um, right. For, like here's a really simple thing I never really thought about, but the game told me to do, and that is with your f- magic user. So Urk in this example. Whenever you have the option of not going into close com- combat, you should always take it with a magic user because yes. then they can avoid getting hit and they're right. very and they're very fragile. Mm-hmm. I never really protected my magic users in that way previously. And so I now I'm really... understanding the whole situation of, of that one chapter on Sacred Stones where you kept letting uh, <laughs> your magic unit die. I can't remember who it was, but you just um, kept loot. letting her die. Loot, yeah, yeah. You kept letting her die. I was like, Bali, how can you keep doing this? Like, do you know what, like, what you're supposed to... And clearly you had no idea that the way that you play a magic user is unless it's an archer, you st- step a space away. Yeah, exactly. If it's an archer, you put them right up close to the archer, and they're really versatile in that way. Absolutely, uh, yeah. And against heavy armored units, they do tons of damage, which is really great on a lot right, of Right, because those guys will have high physical defense, but they'll yeah. have low magic defense. Yeah. Um, so it makes sense. Now, if you think about it from like a Pokemon perspective or whatever, it makes yeah. sense uh, from, from so, the... Yeah, really, really getting into it. I think the art and the music is top-notch. I love the sprite animations. I love... I posted one of these on Meverse just earlier today. I love the sort of still artwork stills you sometimes get right. during cutscenes that are just of like uh-huh. it's just anime art basically. It just just looks really nice to like contextualize the story and what's going on and setting the scene. I I really love those little bits. Really simple stuff. Are you using the smoothing over option on the Wii U Virtual Console again? Yes, um, I did this with Advance Wars as well. Um, for whatever reason, it just looks infinitely better on both the big screen and the gamepad. When you and you've been mainly playing on the gamepad, right, for this one? I've played all of Fire Emblem yeah. so far on the gamepad, yes. But um, basically, for whatever reason, the natural pixels mm. look absolutely horrible when <laughs> when you just because they're yeah, blown yeah, up sure. on the big screen, I guess. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I smooth over the pixels. Um, what else do I want to say about it? A lot of memorable music. You were talking about the music a bit, but um, a lot of memorable tracks in there. Yeah, I, I think that's partly just a, a Smash Brothers thing, and like sure, you've kind of um, subconsciously absorbed these tracks over the years, and so they're now like actually hearing the original versions. Yeah, so that's that's cool. I guess. And the plot is kind of interesting. It's it's. It's quite hard to always follow and keep track of all the characters. It feels very sort of Lord of the Rings, Game of Thronesy kind of numbers of yeah. characters, and I've yes, always absolutely exactly. Absolutely. I always struggle to keep up with each and every person and what's going on yeah. where and that. Well, I mean, the first ten chapters are a localized story, so that whole thing is one story arc, and once you get to the end of that, you'll start the second half of the game, which oh, is uh, a different story. So, so yeah, it's 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 all nice and packaged in, which is the, the great thing about Fire Emblem Seven is it starts off teaching you, and it does it goes through a whole basically tutorial campaign yeah. uh, which is fantastic so so like i said i just cannot say enough good stuff about this tutorial campaign it's exactly what i needed i'm really glad you recommended this game to me because you were you were at pain to see me in pain with sacred stones yeah, <laughs> um just yeah. sort of struggling along and i'm just trying to think of the equivalent of what i, I guess it's like me throwing you in like Oh yeah, MBZ, you'll love F Zero. Here's F Zero GX Story Mode or something. <laughs> oh, it's so much fun. Yeah. It's that kind of like, yeah. no, actually, you should kind of start with a different mode or a different aspect of that game franchise. Sure. So yeah, I'm really enjoying it. I think I, I think I'm now super prepared to go on with this game and even come back to Sacred Stones and maybe pick up another Fire Emblem after that because I I do now understand the mechanics quite a lot better and Excellent. it's good. I'm liking it a lot. Yeah. I checked up on the character Marcus I mentioned, uh-huh. and he shows up in chapter eleven. So he okay. will be the first, the first chapter of the second story. So that's why I kind of localized in my head because he he is like at the start of that story, but not the start of the tutorial. He's stuff, like so. um, Seth. Yeah, basically, he's the Seth of of this game. Yeah. Uh, although he's nowhere near as good, and you just shouldn't use him whatsoever. So, okay. uh, yeah, <laughs> just just keep that in mind, essentially. Um, so good, cool. uh, good stuff, Bali. Uh, we will look forward to your progress through this game uh, as the weeks roll on. Mm-hmm. So uh, look forward to hearing more. 
uh, about that. So awesome. what you've been dipping into, MBZ? So, uh, I've played quite a few different games uh, over the past couple of weeks, uh, but the main one I'm going to talk about today is a, uh, wouldn't you believe it, it's a puzzle platformer. Really? <laughs> NVZ played one of those, what, what, are you sure about that? Uh, yes, uh, so I played Teslagrad. Uh, Tesla Grad is really cool. It was actually gifted to me, funnily enough, by one of the listeners of our podcast. He goes by the name Finns Rudd, uh, and very kindly for my birthday, he uh, gifted me on Steam a copy of Tesla Grad. And I was like, wow, that's really nice. Like, I, I don't expect people to do that, and it's always really wonderful when people do. And uh, I just thought, you know, I, uh, I'm a huge fan of these games, and I should just get on it as soon as possible uh, and talk about it to uh, to say thank you uh, for him Did, didn't, you, me, didn't so. you get Shadow of Mortal gifted as well? So yeah you've been uh, playing two I, games this week that we both gifted. Yeah it's, it's kind of the point where I'm like kind of being guilted <laughs> into like these people bought me these games I should probably not let them sit there and stagnate so uh, yeah I will I'll, I'll talk a bit about Shadow of Mordor maybe but I'm probably going to save that for next time um, but yeah so uh, Tesla Grad uh, it is a 2D puzzle platformer and you think about the name right and the idea Tesla Nikolai Tesla you know he's very much a scientist based around electricity if you know your history and science right I'm, mm. I'm pretty sure that's right. I'm not sure if I'm getting this wrong or not, Bally. But you know Nikolai Tesla, right? Uh, I just remember, like, volts and ohms and amps. Yes. Well, Tesla Tesla was a guy who did electricity stuff, I'm sure. it was. I saw a movie which had him mentioned in it. Oh, it must be true, then. <laughs> it must be true. The movie's always right. Anyway, so that's kind of the main concept behind this game. The main... Uh, uh, mechanic, one might say. You know, a lot of the time with these puzzle platformers, there's a central theme, a central mechanic that everything's based around. And this game is based around electricity. So you have the idea of magnetism and the idea of repelling stuff. So most of the puzzles that are, you know, located within uh, the main sphere are uh, hitting things to turn them the color red, which will repel the color uh, basically it's the same thing so if it's the same color it will repel if it's the different colors it will attract so it's using different puzzles like that and you get loads of different items and stuff to manipulate it um, so yeah that's that's basically the, the main uh, crux so all of, your of items puzzles. relate to electricity and magnetism and this red right, blue right in some way okay um, so that's everything from flying around to shooting stuff to what kind of items do, do, do you get well, so you you start off and you don't have the ability to uh, magnetize yourself. Uh, so very late in the game, you get this thing which is called the polarity hood. And at that point, you can either basically switch on the blue magnetism or the red magnetism, and it allows you to basically float through areas and make things easier. But to begin with, like you have to use the environment around you. So there are these robots which walk around, and if you touch one of them, you'll get some magnet, some blue magnetism added to you. And then you need to use that to jump on a place and repel yourself up. Uh, you'll come across uh, just like these flowers on the ground that basically do the same thing. If you touch them, they add the magnetism. So you'll find points later on where you're coming back and going through other areas where you won't have to use these environmental things because you already have uh, the inbuilt ability to do it straight away. Uh, so that's really cool. And, you know, when you're... I'll, I'll get to the uh, end game stuff, which is kind of annoying, but you do have to go back through and do uh, some bonus collectibles if you want to finish the game, unfortunately. But uh, we'll get to that. But the thing I want to concentrate on, first of all, is it seemed to me very Metroid-y from the outlook. It looked like, you know, you're uh, going to get upgrades and you're going to go back and backtrack. But that's not really the case. Um, the whole thing is built around this castle. And there's a central linear, I guess... A drop, like a giant drop, like okay, okay. What's let's a drop. Let's say, um, a like no, not a moat. Um, I'm trying to struggle for the word here. Uh, oh my god, why can't I think of the sodding word? Uh, <laughs> it's like drop. the thing, the thing where you a put cliff. a bucket, the well, a well, a well, a well. Okay, there we go. Well. I got it. Okay, so so imagine a well because it's like circular and really deep. Mm -hmm. So imagine the spine of this castle is just this circular central thing. And the way that you traverse is you go left and right into rooms uh, on the side of this well. Okay. And you're basically, no, go you. you're basically making your way up the tower. Yeah. Um, 
by doing that and you're unlocking the gates and stuff as you go and you're generally progressing pretty linearly so there's not a lot of i got this new thing and i can go back and unlock that area because you just need to keep chugging you need to keep going to get to the top so that was the thing that kind of surprised me i was like huh this is not actually that metroid do you so. not do you not quite like that um, more linear style though because I mean your favourite Metroid is Fusion which is yeah. arguably the, the most linear Metroid. Sure. Uh, yeah I do I, I do like it. Um, I think it uh, of course loses some of the elements which make you know Super Metroid so great but that's mm. fine for me you know I'm, yeah. I'm perfectly okay with that because I like the adrenaline rush of just continuing continuing. I like the idea of making progress right and sometimes in Super Metroid, you find yourself, I don't know where the fuck to go, right? You you, yeah. you kind of look around and you're like, oh, we're this place, that place, um, you know, and you have to check your map and you keep rolling around in circles. And the great thing about this is that never happens. Like, you always are pushing forward, which is great. And uh, it's, yeah, it's it's just a nice uh, setup, I think. So that's good. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely more of a puzzle platformer than uh, that kind of style of thing. You don't have too much ability to kind of attack enemies or anything a lot of it is just figuring things out like when it comes to the first couple of bosses it's more using the environment around you and dodging out the way and kind of taking the opportune moments to attack them to deal damage as opposed to a straight on i have a gun or whatever and i'm shooting them so that makes the bosses really interesting especially the first few where you're i mean the the basic big thing here is you die in a single hit so it can get really tough, especially when the bosses have multiple phases and you're constantly going through them again and again. It it starts to get into this loop where you're like, oh man, this is, you know, this is grinding me down. But the great thing is, I'm going to make this comparison to Donkey Kong Country, which we played recently some of the bosses on that game. Oh, uh, and the complaints I have about that, about how you have to reload every time and how you run out of lives and then you have to go back to the world map. It's this whole rigmarole which makes you not want to continue playing the game, right? And with Tesla Grad, it's instant respawn, and there's no lives, there's nothing of that sort, and you will respawn straight away as soon as you die back in the boss room and you start again. So there is a compelling reason for you to just continue knocking at it. And another thing is, like, if you take a break and come back, you'll probably have forgotten all the patterns, because a lot of this game is based on pattern memorization and being able to execute perfectly. And that's yeah. the thing, when you beat a boss in Tesla Grad, you have perfectly beaten that boss because you can't get hit a single time you have to absolutely be pinpoint on everything so you get to you know half an hour 40 minutes in on this boss and you are just like focused locked in and you know exactly what you have to do and every time you fail you're like okay right let's learn from that let's take this in and go again and go again and go again and for that reason like some of these bosses are so memorable to me because i can just in my mind they're they're burned into my brain the the patterns that i had to do again and again and again uh that, so i think that... Sorry, I was just going to say, that ironically almost reminds me of what we were saying about a game like Super Mario World, where without save states, you are literally having to play through certain levels so many times, just getting better and better at them, that by the time you actually get through the level, you've absolutely nailed it, because yes. that's the only way to get through, is like Mario is, isn't necessarily insta-death, but it almost is. I mean, if you've fallen in a pit or if, you, you've, if you're not Super Mario, it is insta-death. So it's interesting that while it is instant respawn and you have to absolutely nail it, there's still that idea that is linked to a game like Super Mario World, more so than something like Tropical Freeze, um, where you do have to just completely nail it. Yeah, it's i mean obviously in that scenario you're playing through probably multiple levels again and again because of the stupid save yeah, system and that's um, a lot less fun than like what you're suggesting with this game right exactly because this is just a thing that you're focused like you don't have to go back through puzzle rooms that you've already completed the checkpointing system is fantastic that's one thing that i will say is probably one of my favorite aspects is they understand completely when you want to um you know have a checkpoint saved because after you complete a really hard bit you're like oh god i really hope that it doesn't put me back to before that and it doesn't it knows when the hard bits are and it knows uh, when to reward you and to give you the checkpoint and that's something i think more games need to strive for because i think checkpointing can be done terribly and e even the modern games that come around these days sometimes it's really horribly implemented so i have to commend them for that um 
it's yeah, it's really great. Um, I guess other things about the game. Let's talk about the art style. It has this really beautiful hand drawn uh, uh, animation style going for it. Like not every animation frame is drawn in, so it may not look that smooth, but it has that kind of cartoony feel to it. Like this kind of classic cartoon. You were watching a bit of the trailer, Bali. What did you think of uh, how the art style looked? Um, yeah, I was just saying to you at the time, it looked a bit like the cartoon Tintin. Um, yeah, it does. I it, believe it's a French cartoon and comic. Yeah. Um, well, this game is uh, from Norway. It's a Norwegian developer, Rain mm-hmm. Games. Um, so they have like this, I don't know, I, it does have that kind of European feel to it, definitely. Yeah. Um, and, and that's great because like not many games do that. And I think a lot of the time we have developers from the US or from Japan it's not often that you see, you know, these kind of experiences that come from, you know, parts of Europe. Trying is... to frozen yeah, bite. Absolutely. Are they yeah. Finnish? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, yeah I believe they're, so... they're European as well. So probably yeah, some, Scandinavian some puzzle platformers leading the way. Yeah, yeah, it seems like it, which is great. I'm I'm always a big fan of that. Um, it's, it's really awesome. Um, I, I noticed, guess. Um... Sorry, I was going to say I noticed that just in the trailer the boss that they used in the in the trailer was in the background are all the bosses in the background and then... which one specifically was it that you saw oh, i can't remember what it looked like it was just like a massive head in the background oh was... right yeah, yeah i mean that that one is like a conveyor belt machine okay. um, where it's basically the blocks are pushing you into a fire at the end and you basically have to hit the blocks with a certain magnetism and he'll suck them into himself and like explode his face so that's the first boss that you come across and uh it's just you kind of using the environment to hurt him Mm. Uh, as, as as it goes but generally know that the bosses aren't similar to that i mean the second boss is this bird and you, you have it's really clever because the way that you hurt him is you have to use your ability uh the blink boots which is like this zap thing it's used quite a lot for the platforming you basically uh move yourself maybe three or four feet ahead of where you were so you just zap from one instance to another and you have to zap inside of him because his body is like a cage and Mm. throughout like the puzzles leading up to that you have learned that this ability allows you to zap into cages and traverse areas by doing that so it's taking like that learning that you've had from uh you know the previous parts and applying it to the boss design so you have to zap inside him and then hit him with the magnetic glove which then attracts lightning now if you don't get out of the cage quick enough you'll die instantly because the lightning will hit you while you're still inside so you have to zap inside the bird cage hit him and then zap out again and he'll be hit by lightning it's really clever it's really cool and and smart boss design and that just continues throughout the game um so yeah it's, it's really really great and we, i uh i had a lot of fun so we, we were talking about trying to before um and how that's another puzzle platformer where does this rate in comparison to that game is it even fair to compare the two are they similar in any ways do you have a favorite out of the two um i think it's quite hard to compare them uh, just because the nature of Trine is it's more of a uh, story-driven linear experience in terms of just going from left to right. Uh, and this is more like puzzle rooms, I guess. Are the puzzles um, completely different? Like, it's not it's not a physics engine-based puzzles? or I mean, you know, there's, there's physics to the magnetism. Yeah. So you are, like, kind of, um, I guess, hovering over the L and R trigger buttons. Uh, to kind of like maintain like the balance and how much you zoom up and how much you zoom down so you're kind of messing around with that but i wouldn't compare them directly i don't think uh it works as a direct comparison but, do, do, um... do you have a favorite oh god i i would probably <laughs> still say trying to uh there are there are a few things in tesla grad that make it a little annoying at the end which i'm I think i'll talk about now is Basically, you finish the fourth boss and you basically fall back down to the ground and uh, the last area requires you to have 15 of this collectible. So these collectibles... exactly like Metroid Prime. <laughs> yeah, it kind of is. And that's a, one of those things which I'm yeah. like, oh, fuck, why do they do that? So the idea is, like, there are these cards uh, throughout, hidden throughout the levels um, and they require, like, a certain... Uh, I guess ability to get to sometimes so this is where the Metroid element comes in but like the cards don't do anything they're just like 
X collectible. They're just like a collectible for the sake of collectibles, which I hate. I just think it's so stupid. I mean, they have some neat artwork on them, but they don't really do anything. Like they serve no other function other than you Unlocking need to collect this, this to unlock yeah. this thing. So, so basically, I, I was like, oh god. I just I I kind of watched um, another guy who was LPing it, and he just went through and showed like areas where all these things were so i just quickly went through it didn't actually take too long but you needed 15 of them i had six having gone through the game normally and i just don't like that sounds so much like metroid prime (laughs) yeah i just don't like it though because it's like you're right at the end of the game i want to finish it i want to be done like it's not very long it's only five hours or so but i'm like i want to go into the last area i want to fight the final boss and I can't do that until I just go all the way back through the areas I've already been through and collect stuff. I thought that was just a little annoying. It's it kind of like false padding. Like a lot of stuff like in Skyward Sword, you know, with the going down and doing the underwater music notes. A lot of people thought that's you know terrible padding that shouldn't have been in there. It's the same idea of just like, uh, why are you just extending the game for no reason other than to say, you know, it's a little bit longer than it otherwise would be. Um, so that's not something I'm a fan of because I would have just liked to go to the final boss and be done, but um, but I couldn't. So, uh, yeah, that's that's probably one of my more major knocks against the game. Uh, the final boss is fucking hard. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I spent, <laughs> like, an hour, if not more, on him, and just, like, non-stop focus, absolutely in the zone. I had to watch YouTube videos a couple of times to get the technique down for, like, this certain move he does right at the end. I basically, the thing was, I had perfected his entire routine up to the very last thing that he does. <laughs> and Must every time... I mean, it was, but it was also satisfying once I finally yeah. did it. You know, you get to that point where you're like, fuck yeah, I fucking destroyed him. <laughs> did it, nailed it. And uh, I was just that last bit every time. And finally, like, I kind of did it out of a little bit of luck, a little bit of just the right timing. And then I was like, oh shit, I need to make sure I don't fuck up this next easy bit. Because I knew the bit after that was something that I'd just constantly been doing throughout. It was just a similar pattern. And I managed to do it first time. I was like, oh god. Thank God, and uh, and I finished it off, and uh, credits rolled, and I was done. So, yeah, it was it was a really cool game. Uh, you kind of asked me before this about the storytelling in it, and a lot of it's kind of told environmentally. There's no dialogue or anything. Um, it's told through the visuals, and I wasn't paying too much attention to it. I have to say, when it comes to these games, I just don't really care that much. I'm obsessed with the story, no matter how lame or unimportant it is in the game. I always love a little bit of a story. Yeah, well, I don't know. It was just, okay, it was cool, but and I guess the, the other way they tell stories is there are certain rooms you go into, and they have uh, like a mini theatre thing, like a puppet theatre in the background, and if you stand still, it will like zoom in on the puppet theatre, and it will like show like a king, and like a wizard, and there's this whole story of the castle, and, and what happened to it, and you know... Basically, I watched those and I was like, yeah, this seems kind of generic, um, you know, fairy tale stuff. And I wasn't <laughs> too interested by it. But, um, you know, whatever. It was fine. It was a fun game. I don't need the storytelling around it. I, I can just live with the gameplay and be done. So that's what I did. It was fun. Uh, and I should also say, this isn't just available on Steam. It's on Wii U. This is on your home Nintendo platform. So it's... I think the sale is still on until Thursday. It's the Indie Connection sale, the right? Indie Connection sale. So yeah, if you own any, basically, any good indie game on Wii U... Um, <laughs> uh, I you think it's Guacamelee... Guacamelee, um, Trying 2... No, Trying 2's not part of it. Trying 2's oh, really? not part of it, no. Trying 2's uh, normally on sale anyway. Yeah, um, it's Bitch Rip Runner 2. Shovel Knight? No, not Shovel no. Knight. Steam World Dig. <laughs> Steam World Dig, Steam yep. World Dig, yep. So if you um, own any of those, you can buy any other one for 60% off. And Tesla grads in that sale, and so Tesla grads involved for that as well. So yeah, uh, it's definitely one that maybe at some point you should get to Bali. Uh, yeah, it's, no, I, it's a lot of fun. I have binged a bit on games, and I am getting ready to pick up the Metroid Prime trilogy, which is oh, coming geez. out. Um, and I'm picking up the new 3DS, so I, I am going to have to hold back this time. But um, yep. it will definitely be on sale again at some point. Absolutely, yeah, um, will do. It's on my watch later. Yeah. It's uh you know, it's just it's more it's more comfort food for me than anything, I think. Like this is a sort of game I finished it in like three days, I just mainlined it, same as Guacamelee. I was just like, Yeah, I can just chill here, listen to some podcasts and just oh. bang my head <laughs> against the wall on these bosses. So 
yeah, it was it was a fun time, and I recommend it to people. So thank you, Finsrud, for gifting me and allowing me to talk about it on the show. It's a fun game. It's cool. Norwegian studios rule. Yay. Okay. Those Scandinavian 2D platformers. Yeah, uh, brilliant, brilliant stuff. Okay, uh, so I think that is going to be us for this segment. Thank you for uh, sticking with us. We will be back, however, uh, in a little while emails. with some of your emails. So don't go anywhere. We shall return. Okay, we are back, everyone, for the second part of the show, uh, wherein we shall discuss some electronic mail that you have shipped through the web waves to our doorstep. And, uh, of course, as always, you can send in your emails to us to read out to talk about video games at an email address, which is what, Bally? The email address is nyppquestions at gmail.com. Excellent. Very good. That's what we want. So send them there, and yes, you can be read on the show. So how about we start off with someone else? Who doesn't want to be read read on the show? Nobody. Clearly nobody. So let's go. Who we got first, Bally? Our first email is from Zvari1228, and they're from Kansas, USA. Dear MBZ and Bally, Zvari here with another question and personal game of the year for you. I'm not sure if you've covered this in a previous episode, but what is your least favourite Nintendo game or franchise? Mine has to be Yoshi's Island. The only game I've played in the series has been Yoshi's Island DS, and it was meh. Yoshi's fluttered jump and egg throwing just doesn't gel with me. The different partners like Baby Peach or Baby DK were pretty cool though. As for Game of the Year, my favourite game that I played this year that didn't come out this year is Fire Emblem Heroes of Light and Shadow for the DS. It is the 12th game in the series but is a remake of the third game in the series, Mystery of the Emblem, and is a sequel to Shadow Dragon. Sadly, it was only released in Japan, so it must be played on an emulator with a translation patch to play in English. This was the first Fire Emblem game to introduce a customizable character as we, as well as the casual mode, where fallen units return at the end of the chapter. The game has a gigantic number of characters and can be pretty difficult on higher difficulties. Every Fire Emblem fan should try it, even if they haven't played or didn't like Shadow Dragon. It is a unique experience. All right, um, that's cool. Uh, very hard to obtain game, of course. You know, through emulators, you're gonna have to do that. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not. A, I, I hate Shadow Dragon. I'm just gonna say that. I'm, I fucking despise Shadow Dragon, and there is nothing like motivating me. What? What's wrong with it? Uh, a lot of things. I'm not gonna go into it. It's, just, <laughs> it's not. It's not good, uh, in my opinion. Anyway, um, but. Yeah, I mean, maybe at some point I'll try this, but I'm just so unmotivated to right now uh, that it's just not not down my alley. But let's uh, jump to his question. How about that, Bally? Um, his least favorite Nintendo franchise is Yoshi's Island. Uh, clearly, hashtag Jeff Gersman was right. And uh... No, it's very honestly, like... Yoshi is a flawed franchise, I agree, but that's the only reason it's a flawed franchise is that there's only one awesome game in that franchise, and that game (laughs) is the original Yoshi's Island on SNES, and obviously I've not played the original, I've played the remake, but I still really like the remake, plenty of others like the remake as well on the Game Boy Advance, and it's really harsh to like do Yoshi's Island down before you've at least played the best game in the franchise. So it's Yoshi's like Island saying... DS is also known by many as a giant piece of shit. So <laughs> yeah, true. And like, it's like saying I hate I don't know Zelda and only ever playing well the his... CDI games. I was gonna say, yeah <laughs> CDI games. I was about to say something far more controversial, what, what, um, like Zelda Two or Majora's Mask. Yeah, like, like Zelda Two, the original Zelda Majora's Mask. I might even put in there, but um, 
Yeah, so I definitely recommend Yoshi's Island. And I, I actually am keen to try some of the other Yoshi's Island in the series. Probably the 3DS one more so than the DS one, but... Yeah, the 3DS one got really middling kind of yeah, average and, um, and I can just wait reception. for Woolly World, which I'm sure will incorporate a few of the mechanics from Yoshi's Island. Um, yeah, I think, I think I'm not going to put money down, but I can almost guarantee that uh, Woolly World will be the best Yoshi's game since the original Yoshi's Island. I, I have I high don't hopes. I think for that that's one. too hard to do, but I no, agree. I don't yeah. think. Uh, but, um, you know. but yeah, least favorite Nintendo game or franchise? Do you have one lined up, Bally? Or uh, um, am I going to have to try and dig it and find out? When I think about least favorite Nintendo franchises, I think of a lot of the NES ones that I don't care about at all, and have also tried to play and think are terrible. So I guess my example, you know, just pulling out of my ass, would be Ice Climbers. I think yeah. Ice Climbers is. <laughs> just a piece of shit it's so bad uh, I tried playing it because it's on the uh, 3DS Ambassador program and the platforming's horrible the game is just not fun I just I, I spend 10 minutes with it and get nowhere and just don't I just give up um and you know, seeing as their lack of inclusion in Smash Brothers sees uh, that they don't really have much of a future as a Nintendo franchise, uh, that seems to be okay with me because I'm, I don't know, they they had this one game and it wasn't very good in my opinion. So, anything I... uh, for you? And... I don't know. All the Nintendo franchises I'm not into are normally ones that I've just not played. There's very yeah. few Nintendo games I've played start to finish and sit, come back and said. That was really shit. <laughs> um, yeah. But I mean, certainly a series or a franchise that is really struggling with me in general. And I I don't feel like I love, genuinely love any of the games in that series is like 2D Mario. Like I, I do like 2D Mario, but I've, I don't think I've ever loved it. And like I can yeah. say, I I genuinely love most other Nintendo games, whether that's anything from Star Fox sixty four, Advance Wars three D and two D Metroid, three D and two D Zelda, like just so many great games. But just two D Mario just really is falling flat for me in general. And I'm not saying that that, that can't be recovered with something like Mario Maker, but um, it's just not in a great place for me right now. I don't know. I think it's a bad place for Nintendo right now, yeah. quite honestly, after the four games of basically cloning one after another with the new Super Series. Um, I I do tend to agree with you on that. It's really weird when you think about the original Super Mario Brothers is one of these defining games, which, you know, the blueprints for which are in so many things that followed it. But for me... I prefer other platformers to Mario most of the time. Like, most of the platformers I love are not 2D Mario games. They are other things, either Nintendo franchises or, you know, indie games that have come out or, you know, something like Rayman Legends from Ubisoft. You know, it's it's really weird that they are kind of the pinnacle of 2D uh, platforming and yet I I don't really connect to those that much. Um, or, or probably the weakest Nintendo game I played last year was Kirby and the Amazing Mirror. Yeah. And I've heard a lot of different people say that Kirby as a franchise is incredibly hit and miss in that there are unique platform experiences such as Canvas Curse or what's that one with the millions of Kirby's that got okay reviews? Uh, Mass Attack. Mass Attack. So I've heard good things about that and Triple Deluxe seems to have pleased quite a few people last year but I just think there's a dearth of really half-assed meh Kirby games out yeah, there. Yeah, definitely. I yeah. think Kirby Amazing Mirror is potentially one of that I just didn't particularly enjoy. It was okay. It was good fun but it wasn't like genuinely enjoyable um so yeah kirby and mario you know you pull up your socks come on yeah yeah, yeah. well <laughs> uh, i think yeah certainly it's hard to say get, like franchise that we hate but you know as, as far as far as like least favorite goes then yeah that's uh that's probably a good indication i would say um unless you're going back and you know talking about shit like urban champion and ice climbers and nonsense on the nes but uh you know, that stuff is just hard for us to go back to personally because we have literally no nostalgia for it and, uh, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't connect with us whatsoever. So, uh, yeah, so thank you very much for the question, Zvari. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Now, our next question is from Oli. Good day, MBZ and Bali. It's Oli from Hanoi, Vietnam. However, I'm only on holidays and originate from Sydney, Australia. Right. 
All right. <laughs> Barbie. That, was, that came out all wrong, but anyway. I've spent a lot of my holiday listening to your podcast whilst traveling up the coast, and your podcast is currently my, far, my favorite by far. Anyway, three questions. Number one, what are your favorite DS games that you'd recommend someone who used theirs as a Pokemon machine? All right, should we tackle these in order then? Yeah. Let's just go down. Okay, so if you're looking for something that has, I guess, RPG qualities to it, um, there are quite a few of good ones on the DS, certainly. Um, I think the one I would recommend the most for someone who's a Pokemon fan is Dragon Quest IX. Um, so Dragon Quest games have been around since you know the dawn of time uh, in Japan, and they came across to America and then you know Europe and stuff later on. But they're very simple RPGs, but they are really satisfying, and they have you know great visual design and very similar kind of battle system to Pokemon because it is all turn-based. Um, so that's something that you could connect with pretty easily and Dragon Quest 9 is definitely one of the first like non-Pokemon RPGs uh, that I had played in in a long time and uh, it's great it's a great portable thing it will last you a really long time so I have a, a good pick for that one uh, another good RPG on the DS is the Mario and Luigi games there's Partners in Time and there's Bowser's Inside Story I've played Partners in Time and a lot of people see that one as not as good as the third game so I'd probably recommend Bowser's Inside Story if I was to say one of the two um, so that's that's a really good one to go for and then I'd probably say something like Chrono Trigger because that's also available on DS and most people call that one of the best RPGs of all time even though I haven't played it and that's one I really need to get to on uh, you know my backlog of classic games that uh, everyone should have played so I think those are a good three to, to go on uh, at this point in time is there anything Bally that uh, sticks out to you uh, I know you haven't really played any DS RPGs but anything just from the DS in general that you would recommend yeah I mean my favourite DS game is probably Kirby Canvas Curse like it yeah. uses the, the, the hardware in a really cool unique way it's a great looking sounding game really well designed uh it's spiritual success is just about to come out with rainbow curse super excited for that so that'd be my number one and then after that i think spirit tracks is a really great zelda game there was a there was a lot of flaws with phantom hourglass from before and they really changed a lot of stuff for spirit tracks that made it just work a bit better really um, but you know what? I actually have a really terrible DS collection. Yeah, we're just full, looking through your yeah, backloggery. It's and, full uh... of utter crap, to be honest. <laughs> like, I don't know. I just bought a lot of the games that were aimed at aimed at women basically like really <laughs> wow. like cooking guide games and 10 dogs animal crossing i was into all of those and big brain academy that kind of thing but you go on a feminine side bali it's, it's fine I've got so an we all need side, it we all need it yeah. so i wouldn't um, really recommend any yeah. of those but yeah I guess another one I'd throw out there is The World Ends With You. Uh, that was a very popular, uh, kind of really weird RPG uh, that I've played a little bit of, but um, never got too deep into. But that's also a cool pick for the DS. Um, all right, what's, what's the next question he has? Do you think some of the Wii U's commercial failure is the lack of mature-looking or realistic content? No. Uh, no. <laughs> no, I, no, no, no. I, I think there are w many problems with Wii U and the lack of mature games is certainly not one of them. Um, you know, you could go ahead and put all the Call of Duties and everything on the system and it's just not, it's not going to make a difference. Like, it's going to make zero difference because when you, you come down to the fundamentals of a machine, a Nintendo machine in particular, people buy it for Nintendo games and that's why the install base for something like Call of Duty is so pathetically low or like assassin's uh, and, creed yeah like even assassin's Wii creed it's just horrible yeah and they just don't sell uh, and this is obviously why you know ubisoft and activision are pulling their titles because there's no reason to put the effort and resources in when you're not going to even make or break even on uh you know the game sold so yeah it's it's i don't think that that's a problem i think it's a lot of other issues the marketing you know just the name too many things to list but the idea of Nintendo being held back by the fact that they don't have mature looking or realistic content I wouldn't go for and I think Nintendo have a good kind of window in the market right now for the younger audiences because you take a look at the landscape of PS4 and Xbox One 
I can't think of games that you would recommend for like a family to get for young children. There's nothing out there because literally everything on those machines is mature content. Um, and I, you know, it's if you're going to go for a system for you know young kids, that we use the only one that you can really get something decent out of. So I don't know. It's uh, it's a problem, but I don't think it is the prevalent problem or the most important one. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think the Wii U, from a marketing perspective, has just always lacked clarity. Like, you yes. don't really fully understand what it's all about. Is it, is, it, is it an expansion for your Wii? Is it something different? Who, what games should I get for it? I don't know. What the hell's a gamepad? What do you even use that for? Um, it's just marketing clarity was the biggest failure um i actually am happy with the game content as a game system and it's probably already my favorite game system of all time potentially uh gamecube is between that and gamecube for me i think it just needs one or two more big hitters and it's probably there because i think that it's got some great content great games it's just the marketing has been horrendous and i think you can put the commercial failure down to that i don't think you could honestly say that mario kart 8 is a worse mario kart than the wii version or say the brand new smash brothers that's come out is a worse version of smash brothers than the wii version like it's not to do with how good the games are it's just the way they've been marketed and sold to an audience yeah absolutely we've talked about this a lot (laughs) i'm sure this will come up again just tune in next time and i'm sure we'll mention it at some point um yeah so yeah as always question Uh, number three what are our real names this is the hardest question of all Bally. But my name is Bally, what are you talking about? <laughs> Born and christened Bally Bally. Bally Bally. <laughs> yeah. Uh well I've I've said my name before, uh, on my channel and everything. Um but my name my real name is Naman. It's spelt N A M A N. He's the only one who says it like that, by the way. Everyone else says Naman. Well my family my family says uh says that. They're the only ones who can say it right. Yes, exactly. Because it's an Indian name, yes. so uh, you know it's hard, it's so hard to pronounce for all these thick fucking white people. So. <laughs> <laughs> nah, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. N a m a n. Nah, man. I know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Bali, are you are you comfortable with revealing? Yeah, well, what, Bali what? comes from my name, which is a Scottish name, Alistair Ballantyne, and basically. Alistair Ballantyne is shortened to Ali Bally, and then Ali Bally just becomes Bally, so that's how where Bally came from, basically. So yeah, and despite the fact that um, I used to call him Alistair B because <laughs> our other friend Ali T, of course, was so ba- basically we have Al- two Alistairs, yeah. and I have to differentiate between the two of them. So I used to be Ali B, Ali T, and then at some point everyone just started calling you Bally, and it just stuck yeah. and now that's just I, I it feels strange calling you Alistair ever like it's just a yeah. weird thing yeah. so there's very, yeah. there's not many people who call me Alistair anymore it's very no. well there's a few but not uh, not a great deal no exactly <laughs> yeah so so there you go the, the mystery the has mystery. been lifted <laughs> indeed indeed uh, alright do we have time for another email do you think Bally yeah we've got time for at least one more alright so next question is from Robert Hi guys, I wanted to hear some of your general thoughts on Mewtwo's upcoming inclusion in Smash 4. Obviously it was a huge fan request, but some friends of mine and I felt that Pokemon as a franchise is more than well represented in the roster. Do you guys think that more characters will be put into development if enough fans voices... Sorry, fans voice their wants? Or is the already huge roster at critical mass? Thanks. All right. Uh, I don't think we've really talked uh, too much about Mewtwo uh, in Smash Four and our opinions. Uh, are you excited to, to have Mewtwo in the game, Bally? I was never the biggest Mewtwo fan, but yeah, I'm excited. It's nice. I think I'm more excited about the precedent of being able to patch in a whole other character more yeah. so than I am about Mewtwo himself, probably. Just because he's a very floaty character and I've never been great with the Mewtwo's or the Lucario's or that kind of characters in this game so him as a character I'm not hugely fussed about but it's a really cool idea that we're getting more characters hopefully 
Yeah, hopefully. I mean, Sakurai has not really said anything regarding any more characters. In fact, it's kind of been the opposite at the moment. But I I have no doubt that Nintendo are going to be on him and be like, look, we need you to do more of this because Smash Brothers is the biggest thing we have going and we can make a lot of money doing this. So it will most likely uh, there will be more. Um, but I, I, ag- I agree with Robert when he says that Pokemon is more than well represented uh, in the Smash roster. We have maybe five uh, current count, I think. If we go Lucario, Charizard, Jigglypuff, Pikachu, uh, and... Greninja. Greninja, right. So we're going to have six with Mewtwo as an inclusion. Um, It's kind of like nearing Mario Brothers levels of inclusion here with Pokemon. And I guess that makes sense. I would say it's probably their biggest franchise, second to Mario, um, if not bigger i don't know pokemon's pretty fucking pokemon's huge bigger than mario in terms of sales i thought yeah yeah well i mean it is definitely like a franchise that i guess deserves to have a lot of representation because of how big it is as part of nintendo's lineup but yeah i i would prefer to have some other stuff in there um but do you think uh that they're gonna be you know uh more characters being included if, if fans voice um uh, i'm sure i think it, it... <laughs> In general, I think it's quite an unhealthy precedent to to just say that if enough fans voice for X, then it will happen. Because Mm. looking through Nintendo's history, while that has happened on a few occasions, it really hasn't happened a whole lot. Um, well, I mean, you look very recent history at uh, Project Rainfall of the people trying to get the release of Xenoblade, the last story in Pandora's Tower in North America, and that worked. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not sure if you can and 100%... Turd. Right, and I mean, you, I'm not sure if you can 100% put that down to fan, um, you know, tr- fans trying to uh, pressure Nintendo, but I'm certainly sure it held, you know, a part of the aspects of why they brought it over. Um, so Yeah, I... I, I... Nintendo will never come out and say we only did this because so many fans wanted it. They sort of will present it as some fans wanted this and here we are. It's not like a... How do you say it? It's not like a... Chick- what am I trying to say? It's not like one cause, one is causal of the other. Right, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's... <sighs> I, I don't know. And I do think there are far too many Pokemon in the game. It'd be nice to look at other franchises to get some other uh, characters in there. Um, but in general, I think it's really cool news. Mm. Do you think the roster's too big? He's asking if it's a critical mass ballet. Do you think that it can stand any more characters to be added? I don't think... I don't think there is ever a limit on a fighting game as to how many characters you can have. But I do think... I think Sakurai has said in numerous interviews just how difficult it is to create a character for Super Smash Brothers, like the way it has to get balanced on every other character. And it's not just a case of creating, like, say, a track in Mario Kart. Apparently, it's far more work than that from a technological standpoint. And understanding that, I think the idea that we're going to get constant characters coming out frequently is maybe unrealistic but i do think there's the potential for a few more yeah i certainly think so and i think you know we had been theorizing about this before and we take a look at the roster on the 3ds version and how very nicely fits in four extra characters right and if the first one of those is mewtwo are we going to get three others is that going to be how this kind of pans out in the future that seems like the most likely scenario and um yeah, I, I I think that there is certainly uh, potential, but whether it will be fulfilled or not, that is another matter, and it's it's really on Sakurai and, and the team over at Namco and, and how they feel about doing that. But I'm sure Nintendo will Nintendo will uh, make it worth their while, most likely. So so we'll we'll see. But um, well, yeah. I think um, that's all we've got time for. So. Again, our email address is nyppquestions at gmail.com. We always need more. Send in your ideas, your questions. Your If you've, if you've got a game of the year, still tell us. That's interesting. Um, tell us your stories, everything. We're keen to find out. Indeed, indeed. Uh, so we are going to be zooming off to our next segment where we're going to talk about Club Nintendo. But do not go anywhere. We will be right back.
Okay, and we are back once again uh, with the final segment of our show this week. Of course, uh, sad, sad news came to us all, although maybe sad news on the horizon of better things to come. Uh, of course, uh, the eradication of Club Nintendo from the world. Uh, so uh, this news broke uh, initially, and I thought it was only for Europe, because the NeoGAF thread went up, and it was Europe only, but then slowly but surely ja Japan followed, and the US followed, and we all realized that Nintendo are doing something. So Club Nintendo uh, has come to an end, and and uh, we're going to talk more about the future of it uh, after we have reminisced. But first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about our memories of Club Nintendo and uh, what we thought of it and uh, our experience with it over the years. Um, so, Bali, when was it that you first encountered Club Nintendo? Can you remember the moment in time? I have a feeling that there was a long time where I would be buying games and you would see the little leaflets in your games where you could scratch off to get the code and then you'd upload the code to your club uh, Nintendo account to get the stars. I, I remember not actually doing that for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, I don't know if it was you or me, discovered like, hey, we should sign up for this and you get free stuff. <laughs> and then we just Yeah, did and I it. mean, even back then, I don't... Was it fully called the Club Nintendo or was like the VIP Stars Club or something along those lines? I seem to remember it was a slightly different name. Yeah, it, you're right. I don't think it was Club Nintendo. Yeah. But I mean, this is the thing, like, Club Nintendo, I feel, is more of a new thing for people in America, like, it's only was there for maybe seven, eight years or so, whereas I think in the, you know, in Europe in general, that idea of getting a code that you could then input uh, and get rewards back, um, that was there for a very long time. I mean, I have GameCube games, right, with uh, this stuff in, so... so it was, it was around for a long time. Yeah, it was sort of like um, Game Boy, GBA... Um... Game Boy GBA, I mean GameCube GBA, DS, I, there were just tons of games, I remember uploading them all at once, and I, I can't remember what, I, the, I think the first, initially the first kind of rubbish thing I got was like a Mario Kart to Wii hat. Right. It was like just, it was really bad, and the quality was just horrible, and I really regret spending those stars on that. Um, but, but I think the best thing I got early on was um, a Mario Galaxy soundtrack, actually. Um, and I got a mm. Platinum Edition, which had the full works from the, the first Mario Galaxy game. And I put that on my laptop, really enjoyed it, still listen to it occasionally um, today. And I think that was maybe 3,000 to 4,000 stars, I can't remember. But it was worth it. And it's just like a cool little thing. Yeah, it does. It does seem like a lot of the items were overpriced at the time. I feel uh, just for what they were. Some some stuff seemed like why is that so much, but that's so little, and it, a lot of it yeah. didn't make a lot of sense. Um, or do you I remember? Mean, I think... Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I, you you tell me. What I was going to say. say, do you remember when the Twilight Princess statue was there for fifteen oh, thousand stars, and we were like seriously oh. considering sort of pooling our resources, and then we kind mm -hmm. of I think we worked out even if we did that, we would be like a good few thousand stars short, and like yes. <laughs> it just would have been an absolute ball ache to try and get to fifteen thousand even between us. Yeah, that was one of the big ones. That was just a an item that was there for so long that I had my eye on. I was like, well, unless I keep buying games every freaking week, I'm not going to be able to get that. It's it's a little bit too far out of hand. But um, yeah, it was it was one that was on the horizon. Um, and there were a lot of good stuff over the years. I think when I started, uh, it was pretty much the same time as you did. But I don't feel like I actually actively looked at the website and went and did stuff on it as much as you did back then because it came a time when there was a change happening and they were um, moving to a new website and they were changing things up and I think they changed the accounts and I tried to go onto the new Club Nintendo after a while and I couldn't log in with my old, old details. I remember going on my old AOL email account because I knew that was the only one I had back in the day and that would have been the one that I would have used to try and uh, log in to my old Club Nintendo account. I just remember sitting there trying to figure it out, seeing if I had old emails and I couldn't find anything and it was really frustrating. There was no way for me to like recover that account whatsoever. So my initial Club Nintendo account I think just disappeared uh, and I 
I wasn't able to get back to it. So I had to make a new one, uh, essentially. And uh, that's the one I have today and the one that I've been using. Um, but it certainly was like this gap of time. I, I had to make a new one as well, actually. Yeah. I think it was this gap of time between, I don't know, uh, kind of late GameCube to like early Wii. We weren't paying attention to Club Nintendo at all. And then I think maybe around 2009 or 10 was when I started, you know, uh, digging around again. And I was like, uh oh, hey, yeah, I should probably do this because I had tons of games sitting in my cupboard and I had loads of codes there which just were just going unused and uh, unable to be uh, doing anything unless I went and plugged them in. So that's what I did. And I had a whole day of just sitting there going through GameCube and Wii boxes and even DS stuff uh, uh, and uh, just plugging in those codes uh, to try and top myself up, as it were, and uh, you know, be able to buy some stuff. So, So yeah, uh, it was good. Yeah, it was it was always a hassle putting in the codes and like maybe we could get onto some of the, the things we liked a, a little less about Club Nintendo. Right. I I think the obvious one is the surveys. Like we oh, can't God. sit here and tell you that that is a good part of the system because it is fucking horrendous. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Why is it? Ask me this question. Tell me the answer. Why is it? That Nintendo require you to put in your name, gender, and age every fucking time you have to do a survey. Why don't they have that info on profile? Like they should just have that stuff and not have to ask you every time. It's insanity. These and, surveys and... are designed for like just a general public going out there and giving it to someone you've never met before, not as someone who has an account on the fucking website. Along with questions like, have you ever bought a game? previously in the series and even if you've already registered something from previous in that series right exactly or, like they could have or, ways of doing that it's like did you buy this game with your wii u or wii or whatever it's just like no because you saw me register my wii years ago so stop yeah, asking exactly. me that goddamn question and it's just a bit yeah. frustrating um yeah and you're they're basically getting info off you for not for free but for how, how do you word it they're getting info off you extra the, that you wouldn't normally give and, and the, the stupid thing is because the questions are so dumb you just don't fill them out properly so they're not even getting proper information from them anyway and it's just horrible yeah, especially like with those little question boxes where they're like, would you recommend this to someone else? <laughs> I just, I just sometimes, I just like slam my head on the keyboard and some letters will go <laughs> in. And, and that's that. It's like, there you go. There, those are my thoughts on this fucking dumbass survey, you idiots. Why are you asking me this again and again? Why did you purchase Mario Kart 8? And then I just said, because it's Mario Kart. And it's just like, I just can't be bothered to think of a reason. Or where, yeah. did you, where did you find out about Mario Kart 8? And you're just like, I saw it on a billboard in the street. Or it's like, it's just stupid options that you just you just tick the most convenient thing like the options they have for like the the newest games are things like where did you find out about super smash brothers for wii u and an option is the wii u or sorry the wii shop channel the wii shop channel yes because totally that's where all the information would oh my god infuriating infuriating I guess uh, we could get on the... sorry go ahead no i'm just saying the surveys were you know, a necessary evil, I guess, on Nintendo's yeah. part to just, you know, they're going to give you some stuff for free, kind of, but they have to pull you through this whole uh, thing to do it. So, a bit of a rigmarole, I have to say. And I guess another big downside of the shop, especially in Europe, perhaps, maybe I'm wrong on that one, is just how infrequently it's updated sometimes, and also how terrible some of the items are on the shop are for example just before it shut um well you can still see them on the european uh club nintendo shop now but it's stuff like ringtones and desktop wallpapers and these things that were kind of a big deal back in the early noughties when you just got a laptop or something and like high quality images were hard to come by likewise uh downloading official music and like files was a bit more tricky and it's just really weird the idea that you would spend stars on something that is as outdated as a ringtone the thing which gets me the most 
is the fucking Wii Shop channel and DSi Shop channel cards. Oh, Why are those there? Like, we are three and a half, even off more years into the 3DS life cycle. We're over two years into the Wii U cycle. Why the shit is there Wii and DSi cards on my fucking Club Nintendo thing? Why? What is the logic there? It makes literally no fucking sense. It's ridiculous. I, oh, God. Why? Bloody stupid. Bloody stupid. So I'm glad that that part is hopefully going to be refurbished, right? You expect in the future that they'll offer eShop point cards. You know, that would make much more sense and it would make, you know, our coins or stars or whatever way more valuable um, because, you know, a lot of the times you're kind of struggling. What am I going to spend it on? An eShop credit amount is a perfectly viable thing and, you know, it's something that I would be down with. So absolutely uh hoping that that's going to happen but um, i mean looking back what what were your top three th- items you ever bought on the shop oh man um i'm trying to think of more than three but i know that three that i definitely have that i uh i, I like quite a bit um so i guess uh i have the 3ds xl um kind of carry case as it's not a carry oh, yeah, case it's cool. more like Uh, It's more like a sleeve. It's like a cloth uh, sleeve, but it's a really nice thing. I actually end up keeping my Vita in it more than my 3DS uh, (laughs) because because the Vita obviously has a bare open screen and that's very, uh, you know, susceptible to scratching. Nintendo's already has a slight scratch. Yeah, exactly. They are. They're helping out my, my poor Vita with its its lack of a clamshell, so it can't protect its own screen. Uh, so yeah, it, it fits perfectly into the 3DS XL one. Um, the next thing we have uh, was the Yoshi doll, the Yoshi uh, eating an apple, like the plush doll that we both got very recently which i think is really neat and uh i think my favorite is probably the mario kart 7 trophy uh those were a very limited run on the european club nintendo and uh they are really really cool i only managed to get one of them i believe it was the leaf cup trophy Uh, i wanted the star cup but that one was sold out so i was like ah well i guess i'm gonna have to go for the leaf but i still think it's a super super neat piece of memorabilia and uh, i'm really happy that i have it so what about you bally I can't even think of more than two. Oh, I got my crappy Mario Kart Wii hat that I've like. Oh, yes. It's just so dumb. Don't know why I got that. Um, mm-hmm. I also got the Yoshi plushie, like you're saying. I think that's probably my favorite thing that I've got. Um, it's just really, it's really well high designed. quality. Really high quality. Yeah. Um, it's it's nice theming in that those that fruit has been in a few games that involved Yoshi. For example, Galaxy 2 has them. They're in Yoshi's Island, I think. They're in the original Mario world, so I thought that was quite cool. Are Um, they one of the fruits in Sunshine that he can eat? Maybe? I can't remember. It's been a while, hasn't it? Definitely Galaxy 2, yeah. Um, Yeah. And like I was saying earlier, I got the Mario Galaxy soundtrack, which I think is pretty cool. Like, maybe that's my favorite. I don't know. Um, but other than those three, I'm really struggling to think of anything substantial I got. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely more in recent times that I have been getting things. Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean that to, maybe that that's whole. the 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 biggest trick in the book of this whole procedure is that we're both pretty big Nintendo fans. And we buy a lot of games, a lot of systems. We've pretty much uploaded all our stars between systems and games onto um, the Club Nintendo account. And we've, like, three three pretty cool things apiece over the space of, like, yeah. ten years or something. It's quite... Well, makes you think. I, like, I, I, wow. know, I know you can think of it in that way, but you can also think of it in Nintendo could have given us nothing, right? We could have just exactly. bought the games and got yeah. nothing. So if you just look at it from the perspective of, hey, this is a neat like little bonus thing we're getting... I can't be too angry at it, honestly, and uh, it, it gave me some cool stuff. So you know, why why wouldn't I be you know pleased with the stuff that I have? So yeah. So I think if we just take it from that perspective, it's it's fine. Um, but yeah, so uh, all of that's coming to an end, Bally. It is uh, it is finishing, and Nintendo have said they are going to be replacing it with something new. Something in the future is going to take over Club Nintendo, and uh, I thought that we'd do a little bit of uh, speculation here, maybe in thoughts on uh, you know what's going to happen with Club Nintendo. Um, so, what are your uh, theories going in here, Bally? What what are they going to pull uh, in um, the future? I just think more of an effort on free digital stuff. Um, we we already are getting the feeling that potential of 
accounts being becoming more and more unified, I think with that, the ability to reward customers and fans with um, digital content seems like it could be much easier. Um, or I don't know how they would do well. It'd be nice if you could just buy games digitally and then your stars or points or however they're going to call it in the future, it gets, it all gets topped up aut- automatically into your account. Like Oh yeah, not, absolutely. The fact that you can now get digital games, it should be automatic. And then you just go to your account and then you could look up some shop. I don't know. Maybe, maybe what if the whole shop... What if the whole stars catalog, as we previously knew it, was now on the eShop? And right, you yeah. go through the same process, you could put in your home address, and you could, they could send you hard stuff, as in, like, real-life plushies or whatever. <laughs> hard stuff. Hard stuff. <laughs> yeah. Hard stuff. Um, and then, so yeah, you could have that, or you can obviously spend those points on something digital. I don't know. Mm. I think some people have been speculating that Nintendo, you know, they've been saying for a while they're going to be doing something based on phones, right? Like creating their own app and potentially uh, tying something in with a Nintendo app, maybe, uh, where you can, you know, do all your digital purchasing from there, right? You know, being able to have a web store, uh, for example, if you're out in the country, you want to buy a game on your Wii U, be able to do that and have that integrated a bit more. Uh, what do you think of the potential of maybe something along the lines of an app happening? Uh, anything? Um, I, I, I think if they were going to do something app-related, it would be better to have a store on the app and not... I'm really skeptical about Nintendo doing games on fans. I'm just really no, no, no. I, that's that. not what I mean. I okay, mean yeah, just no, as know, kind but... of a, a portal to get the games on the systems. Just you know, having it yeah, that would be cool do through that medium. If Amazon yeah. and eBay can do it, then why can't Nintendo? And I mean, yeah, exactly. It is always a mental thing between turning on a Wii U and going to the eShop versus just accessing an app on your phone. Like that is cutting out a middleman, as it were. Yeah, absolutely. Do so, you agree? Do you think th- that could be the something they do? Um, yeah, uh, I think generally, though, what we're seeing is the unification coming about, finally. Like, we already have the wallets tied together for 3DS and Wii U. We know that that is basically like the bare minimum that they have done in terms of getting these platforms uh, into a singular thing. And you look at the ending of the Digital Deluxe program that people really liked and wanted to keep. You see the death of Club Nintendo, and you see Nintendo uh, in general moving towards trying to have a more unified platform system. And maybe, you know, with the next console, that will be completely overhauled and, and redone. And you also have the idea of the new 3DS, right? Which your one of your predictions for this year is that's going to tie into getting everything sorted out together and i think this is all going to culminate in just a brand new fresh start for nintendo's digital side and having an account-based system and i don't know will we get a playstation plus style service will we get something that just rewards you for purchasing games digitally uh to try and move people uh, towards that space as opposed to in retail um i it's kind of a nebulous thing going on here but you kind of get the ideas that i'm hammering at i think you know, they are just moving towards that step uh, more than anything else. Um, and it's quite so. interesting that this is this idea of unification is coming in the middle of the system's life cycle. For, well, not maybe not the middle. Maybe we're nearing the end of the 3DS, obviously. But I absolutely, don't, yeah. I, maybe we are with the Wii U. I don't know. But we're definitely right. not at the end for either. So it's interesting that this, they they're taking this step here and now and not waiting one or two years when it's likely that there will be a new system. Well, I think partially it has to do with them trying to make this more of a testing ground for that stuff. Like, they want to... You know, Nintendo, when it comes to online, we know that they are just, you know, 10 years behind the rest of the world. But... Uh, The thing here is, you know, they are trying to modernize and get things right, and there'll probably be some hiccups and some learning curves to go through. I think it's better to get those out the way on, you know, the current hardware and try and figure things out, and then, you know, get to the next system, and right out the gate, everything is nailed down, and they know what they're doing, and they're ready to go, and... Honestly, that makes their launch kind of uh, proposition much stronger, and it means that they are just better set up to sell more systems and, you know, have everything just roll out smoothly for for that period of time. So, 
I, yeah. I see it more as you know them them testing the waters here. I mean, it looked a bit um, dodgy the way that the Miiverse was integrated to the 3DS at a much later date, and it was all yeah. just a bit messy. And both the starts for the Wii U and the 3DS were just so slow, and like the Wii U is only just kind of picking up a bit. And it's just you're right. If they had some sort of feature that they've tested, they've proven that you know the fans like this. We've now launched this new system. It's going to incorporate the same ideas. Boom. And you're right. It could be a lot more successful as a result. Yeah. Um, so, I th- yeah, I, th- I think that the future is certainly much brighter because Club Nintendo was a cool thing. But I think that was it. Like, it stopped it being a cool thing. It wasn't very functional. It wasn't very... Uh, useful a lot of the times and it had loads of troubles especially the web- the website itself just had such shit loading times and just yeah. wasn't re- really well put together and yeah. anytime it was under under heavy load like I tried to go on when they announced this obviously I couldn't fucking get anywhere because they this website's not built to handle that many people using it at once because everyone's just panicking and be like, oh no I need to spend my stars and everything um, so I hope that whatever comes in the future is going to just make things a whole lot better and there was also interestingly enough there was an interview with Iwata uh, sometime in January of 2014 uh, where he was talking about um, the ideas of rewarding customers for buying things digitally and you know making that more of a focus and trying to um, you know find other ways of selling products through their eShop um, and I think you know the, the things he was talking about there are going to come to fruition I think there's an investor meeting sometime soon maybe in mid-February and a lot of people are speculating and I probably think that is the case that they are going to reveal whatever this is at that meeting because it would be smart to do so uh, to get their investors on board and um, yeah I think that uh, that's a good shout probably so one point I'd like to make that is a bit random and off the wall but okay basically one of the few places in the world where you can get these cool gifts that um now correct me if i'm wrong but yeah one of the few places where you can get these cool nintendo gifts is the nintendo world store in new york um at rockefeller yes Center. yes um, i've been a few I know, times well. i know you've been uh, once haven't you i've been once yes, yes. in uh, 2007 Works, yeah, so. so it's a it's an incredible store. I mean, the whole ground floor is set up for video games, and basically the first floor, as Europeans would call it, I guess you call it second floor in America, is basically yeah. entirely clothes and accessories and just crazy stuff that you would a lot like a lot of the stuff that was on Club Nintendo. Is there anywhere else in the world that they have that store? They must have something like it in Japan. Uh, absolutely, Japan will have something. I think Japan also has like the Pokemon centers. Uh, yeah, and which, they have like a um, mini Pokemon think... center at the World Store in New York as well. They do, and I think there are maybe a couple dotted around the U.S. somewhere. But yeah, it, it's it's a very unique location. Like there are not many places in the world that exist that have yeah. that kind of really specific only come here and get it. I mean they were selling you know the Hyrule Warriors whatever crazy special edition yeah there. exactly um, and I mean they maybe do a lot of collector stuff maybe it, they don't even profit from those stores which would surprise me but they should really just try opening a few more of them across the place I mean the, the lack of one in Europe like it would I think one of those maybe London would be bad because <laughs> Nintendo's not obviously as popular in the UK as perhaps other parts of Europe, but somewhere in yeah. Europe, I feel like that would be like just a fun thing to do. It gives them another base where they can promote stuff to the public really easily. That's where they launched yeah. the Wii, wasn't it, in New York? Yeah, so yeah, it was. It was. There's cool and things. I, I don't you know. Do I don't know if that. there is know. one. Because there might be one, I'm thinking, like, if you think about Nintendo of Europe, their main hub is Germany, right? So yeah. there may well be somewhere in Germany that they do have something like that. Uh, that would make the most sense for Let where they would put it. Let us know if you know. Or if you yeah, know. <laughs> I, uh, we, we can research it after this, so yeah. we can find out. But, um, yeah, no, I, th- I think it's just a cool thing. I just don't see there's any real profit that Nintendo makes from making one of those stores because it is so niche and so like it's going to have to be in like one location and really hard for people to get to but I understand what you're saying you're like at least have it in our region yeah. so that there is the opportunity uh, or more of an opportunity for people to maybe go there um, yeah so so I think uh, 
I think that's it. Anything else you want to say on Club Nintendo? Uh, I mean, we still have some time left. I believe in Europe it's until September that stars start disappearing. And Nintendo have said they're going to start putting some new stuff on there so that if people have a lot of points and they don't want to spend them on any of the current rewards that they are going to um, you know, add some. Uh, anything that you think you will be interested in picking up if they put on there? If they put, like, digital games or something? I um, mean, I actually read that if I buy the new 3DS, that I think there's a high probability that it's it won't have any stars associated with it. Like I, don't... I think that's only in America. I'm pretty oh, sure new right. 3DS in Europe will have stars, oh, but I think okay. it will be one of the last products to do it. Um, so I mean, don't quote me on it, but that's just what I heard. I think so. Realistically, we'll I'm only going to be able to get even with all the games coming out this year. I'm only going to get to about three thousand stars, maybe. I think I'm on like maybe fourteen hundred or so at the moment. I can only really yeah. get to about three thousand to four thousand. I don't know. I don't know what I'll pick up. It's maybe like a Pikmin keyring. They looked quite nice, but. Um... I mean, if all else fails, buy a Wii Shop card, get a virtual console game, <laughs> convert it to your Wii U I've by paying an extra dollar. I've wanted a wallpaper for my laptop. <sighs> That's so stupid. That's so stupid. <laughs> it's like, do they not understand that piracy exists? Like, do they not understand you can go on the internet, find any image, and just... I don't know. I, it's, I, it's stupid. So stupid. It's so stuck in, like, the 2000s, the early 2000s. But, uh, exactly. hey... It's going away soon, so we won't have to deal with any of the obnoxiousness uh, of Club Nintendo. How funny would it be if the new thing launches with, like, desktop wallpapers? <laughs> oh, oh, God, don't. That's not even... That's not. Let's just have hope that this will be a brand new start. And uh, I'm actually I'm actually way more excited for this than I was for Club Nintendo at any point. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Good, good times ahead, I think, as long as Nintendo get it right. But I think that is going to close out our show. Uh, thank you all very much for downloading, listening. Uh, however you got it, you can find us on iTunes. That's a great place to go. Uh, and it is easily downloadable. It will automatically do it. That's great. And uh, we hope uh, you will find us uh, very easy to listen to. I don't know where I was going with that sentence. I trailed off. You'll, but, you'll um... find us easily on iTunes. Just look up yes. Now Playing With Power. Or even you can type NYPP and we'll pop up. That's a easy. easy or even or even in um, there somewhere if you look up Nintendo. Yes, exactly. But just you know, there are ways. Don't worry, we're we're there. So so worry not about that. Uh, let's talk about where you can also find out about us on the internet. Bali, you can be found on the internet in places I hear. Uh, where are those places? On the Twitters, I am at Ballyman91, that's B-A-L-L-Y-M-A-N-9-1, and that is also my name on the Meverse, where I I post a bit about Fire Emblem, but I mean, ne- for next time, I think the game I'm going to be playing, MVZ, will probably be Mega Man 2. Ooh, tough times ahead for you, Bali. Uh, a lesson in uh, action platforming, for sure. Uh, so a lesson in safe good. states. Uh, yeah, absolutely a lesson in save states. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as well. I am at Lord NBZ. Uh, that is the same name on Meverse, where I have not done anything as of late, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, you know, I've I've been playing you know Steam games. I'm the Meverse king. I'm I'm look. I'm being on the I've been on the PC gaming kick. I'm gonna got through my backlog but I will get back to my Wii U in uh, due time so worry not about that uh, but yeah that is pretty much going to close the show out uh, we will be back rapping at you in another two weeks time but until then thank you very much for tuning in and uh, I guess uh, we'll see you next time goodbye everyone goodbye
The musical interludes used in today's show were an 8-bit version of the Fire Emblem theme, copyright 2003 Nintendo, and the official soundtrack preview from Teslagrad, copyright Rain Games 2013. Mighty, we didn't do internet podcasts, we talked to each other and it was fine. I like how my old man voice turned into a wild chase voice. <laughs> Back in my day, I was a young whippersnapper who played Yu-Gi-Oh! and didn't do any of this crazy virtual reality. <laughs> it's totally old man wild chase.